Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Good. Um, yeah, hi, my name's uh, Jeremy Skipper. Um, I'm the director of the Language Action and Brain Lab at University College London. I also co-direct the Understanding Neuroplasticity Induced by Tryptamines project, where we use pharmacological interventions to try to understand, uh, among other things, the relationship between the neurobiology of language, consciousness, and mental health and well-being. I'd like to thank uh, my teams, uh, in particular for this talk today, those people highlighted in gold. These are uh, the prior and current PhD students who did all the work today that I'll proudly present to you, um, which uh, I'll be talking about the interrelationship between the neurobiology of language uh, and emotional processing in naturalistic situations. To give you a little uh, theoretical background, or perhaps you may think biases, I think that there is um, that the neurobiology of language and emotional processing are not localizable to a small set of static brain regions. Um, this is uh, at least in part because language and emotions are highly ambiguous when taken out of context uh, and therefore require the use of internal and external context to disambiguate them. Internal context may be things like memory, stereotypes, schemas, uh, et cetera, that direct our attention to external stimuli and external context may be various cues in our environment. So to give an example, uh, emotional facial uh, displays may serve as context to disambiguate language, and conversely, language may serve as context to disambiguate uh, observable emotional displays. Uh, and therefore, uh, these processes are interrelated. Because of this, uh, the neurobiological interrelationship must be uh, dynamic and distributed throughout the brain to the extent to which uh, um, um, language and emotional processing require contextual information which is itself uh, dynamic. Uh, for these reasons that I've just outlined, that is uh, uh, that you have multiple cues, that you, we're interested in context and dynamic processing, we use almost exclusively naturalistic neuroimaging uh, and to test some of the theories like the one I've just presented, uh, we collected the, nat the naturalistic neuroimaging database. The NNDB consists of two sessions. In session one, uh, people uh, basically came in and did the NIH toolbox. And in session two, a few weeks later, participants came in, did functional fMRI, uh, where they watched one of 10 full-length movies that they'd never seen before uh, in the scanner. Um, we've done uh, basic pre-processing or basic standardized pre-processing or relatively standardized uh, on uh, the resulting 86 participants uh, and we've validated the data quality and made it publicly available so you can download it on openneuro.org. Um, today I want to talk to you about five studies uh, so it's going to be a whirlwind tour uh, uh, that we've done using the NNDB, looking at the interrelationship between the neurobiology of language and emotional processing. Uh, I'm not going to give much detail of the experimental methods um, uh, for lack of time. So the first study is looking at the emotional word processing through the lens of multiple cues. So we had the hypothesis that <clears throat> that uh, when you have multiple emotional cues, the brain actually makes use of these cues, and in doing so, it reduces the processing demands throughout the brain. And in particular, we hypothesize that some of those hypothesis, uh, uh, some of those, sorry, reductions in activity would occur in brain regions associated with uh, social processing, or uh, more specifically, use of internal knowledge, uh, or theory of mind regions, or regions involved in uh, self-other processing, these are typically lumped together in the putative default mode network. Um, and to do this, we uh, annotated our stimulus with a separate group of participants. Uh, so people listened to sentences from Citizen 4 and 500 Days of Summer. They rated each sentence uh, on uh, for valence from positive to negative. Uh, we then re, um, rejiggered the score so it ranged from neutral uh, to a positive, effective information for our analysis. And what pr participants did particularly is they saw uh, the visual uh, stimulus from the, um, from the sentences without the sentences themselves, and they rated it on um, valence, 
or in separate rocks, they saw they just heard the semantic information with the prosodic contours removed because the prosodic contours contain emotional information. And in the third block, they re, uh, rated the prosodic information without uh, prosodic contours without the semantic information. Uh, we then uh, quanti or qualified our uh, sentences as to the number of cues they contain. So some cues contain just visual facial displays of emotions um, uh, indicated in the first column here. Um, and uh, other cues contain, uh, other sentences contain multiple cues, for example, oops, how do I go back? Um, so might contain visual and semantic information and some contained uh, three cues to emotional information. Uh, these are the results. So this is a good old blob-based contrast uh, between uh, when you have only one cue in the visual, semantic, or prosodic modalities versus when you have all three cues in the sentences. And what you see is that you have much less activity for all three cues together uh, overall, but in particular you have less activity for all three cues in the entire superior temporal sulcus, bilaterally, the angular gyrus, uh, the precuneus, uh, and, um, and, and various bits of the dorsal prefrontal cortices and cingulate cortices. Um, if you look at individual cues versus uh, one cue versus two cues or one cue versus three cues and put them all on the map, you see something quite similar um, where basically when you have all three cues, the only places where you're doing more processing uh, <clears throat> relatively is in early sensory regions. In the second study, we looked at emotional word processing through the lens of swearing. Swearing's uh, an interesting phenomenon for many reasons, one of which is that they're highly contextually determined. So swears are determined by the social context in which they are used, which then uh, guides listeners to attend to specific social information in the videos. So what we did was we qu uh, quantified or uh, labeled all the swears. Uh, people swore in seven of our movies um, listed here. And then we did, again, a, a contrast between swear words versus tightly matched words, um, uh, which are matched on length, frequency, uh, and emotional content. And we also contrasted them with random words, which were matched on length, uh, but not emotional information. We had the hypothesis that be, because swears cue people into social environments that we would see more activity in these social related processing regions again and perhaps also attentional related regions. Um, and this is the results from the contrast. <clears throat> so swears produce greater activity in red uh, in quite a few regions including again posterior superior temporal angular gyrus, that putative region in MT that may be a third processing uh, pathway for social information on the face. Uh, and importantly, the precuneus. Uh, swears versus random words uh, activated a few regions, including dorsal pre, uh, premotor or prefrontal cortices, as well as uh, the superior parietal cortices, among others. So we took these blob-based regions, and those regions circled in white we used as seeds for some basic functional connectivity analysis, seeing if we could recuperate uh, those entire networks. So on the left, you see uh, the, using seeds, those regions that distinguish um, swears versus matched words. Uh, and you get a distributed set of regions that include, again, the angular gyrus uh, pre, um, and precuneus regions. Uh, and on the right, you see swears versus random words. Uh, and you get a different distribution of connectivity that includes more uh, sensory regions uh, as well as uh, um, um, dorsal lateral prefrontal cortices and the parietal cortices. So we think this is some evidence, if not preliminary, for the fact that swear words are cueing uh, uh, us more into context social contextual information. Next, we looked at uh, emotional word processing through the lens of the amygdala. The amygdala is a putative core region in emotional processing that's very hard to actually find uh, in emotional studies. Um, and so we wanted to understand why this was. Um, and this is actually an exploratory that st uh, study that started when we were looking at meta-analysis of language processing. And we discovered that when people were doing language processing, you get, uh, and you have concomitant activity in premotor cortices and prefrontal cortices more generally, you get a reduction in activity or even a deactivation uh, of the amygdala. Um, 
And one reason we thought maybe this would be is because when we have uh, words presented in isolation, which is most of neuroimaging studies, uh, you have no contextual information, so you have to do more processing, and those uh, premotor and prefrontal regions are engaged more uh, when you have to do phonological or semantic selection and retrieval more, so when you have more demands uh, on those processes. So we thought maybe the de deactivation or reduction of activity in the amygdala had something to do uh, with context and processing demands. So to look into this, we, um, uh, we looked for places when the amygdala was actually activated uh, versus inactivated and deactivated and then did a uh, co-activity-based analysis. Uh, when we found those regions when the amygdala was activated, inactivated, deactivated, uh, four times when there are highly emotional words, we then looked ahead or looked back in time uh, to see whether the contextual information, the semantic contextual information was highly constraining or not. So it had low contextual information or high contextual information. These are the results in the top row. High contextual information results in pr very little activity throughout the brain generally, which is kind of consistent with this uh, predictive coding sorts of frameworks in which we use contextual information uh, to decrease processing demands and we end up with freed up energy. Um, but more interestingly, uh, for um, when you have low contextual information and the amygdala is activated, you get activation uh, or hyperactivation throughout the sup uh, superior temporal gyrus and primary motor cortices, but you also get some interesting deactivations. And so to look into this further, uh, we compared times when the amygdala was activated for inactive or, inactive or deactivated versus inactive. Uh, and what you see here is you get this kind of push-pull relationship. When the amygdala is activated, you get decreases in activity in prefrontal cortices, both uh, on the lateral surface, both superior and inferior, and in the medial surfaces. Um, um, and conversely, when the amygdala is deactivated, you get uh, more activity uh, in these prefrontal uh, regions. So uh, this is quite preliminary again, and we're not quite sure what to make of it, but it does seem that the uh, that there's something about the, the amygdala is activated in particular linguistic context and may be quickly down-regulated by other cortices. Sorry, this is a real fast tour. Uh, so in the next set of studies, I wanted to uh, talk about well-being in the brain. Well-being is partially at least a function of emotional processing among other processes, but it's a very high-level construct, and we wanted to look at well-being in the brain as through the lens of individual differences. Um, given that I see I'm running out of time, I'm gonna skip uh, what are a fairly complicated set of methods, but for the movie 500 Days of Summer, we performed a intersubject correlation representational similarity analysis, but uh, we did so in the spatial domain uh, we clustered uh, the resulting networks. Um, what we found was that uh, there were a set of interrelated networks. Network one included all of uh, the medial prefrontal cortices, the insula, and a bunch of subcortical structures. These are core regions typically associated with mo emotional processing. But we also found uh, a set of networks that predicted individual differences uh, in well-being. Um, uh, that included posterior superior temporal, uh, middle temporal uh, regions, the ventral pre and primary motor cortices, uh, as well as precuneus, it's just not shown here, all um, related to speech perception, uh, language comprehension, and speech production based processes. So it seems that well being uh, rel uh, relatively relies on individual differences in this distributed set of cortices that includes language related regions. To follow up on this a bit more, and this is even more work in progress than the stuff I've showed you so far, we wanted to look at well-being uh, in the brain through the lens of uh, um, predict, uh, individually predictive word categories. So we know from prior studies that uh, looking at journaling or experience sampling that some word categories are more predictive of well-being. So these include things like I terms. So the more I use the word I, the less uh, uh, mentally healthy I'm likely to be, uh, and that's true of pronouns more generally. Um, past present tense words predict changes in mental health and well-being, uh, among other categories of words. So I'm going to uh, roll you through a, a few of these. So what we did was we looked for those categories of words in our movies, uh, and we performed um, uh, 
and a regression analysis comparing those to match words. Uh, and then we use the beta values across participants uh, and a, re a logistic regression to try to predict whether uh, people's well-being uh, as codified into a high and low well-being groups. So we found that the most predictive uh, word categories were positive terms. So uh, people listening to positive terms activated a distributed set of regions, but more so in the anterior cingulate, for example, uh, that predicted uh, well-being with 77% accuracy. Um, we also found that third person, so one of the forms of pronouns, uh, uh, again, activated um, medial prefrontal regions, the precuneus, and that predicted uh, well-being with 76% accuracy. Lifestyle and the related social terms uh, similarly predict um, well-being. Uh, all of the uh, temporal terms, so past, present, and future tense, uh, also predicted well-being. Not everything predicts well-being from our stimuli. So for example, a set of concrete terms, uh, um, so things that are more concrete tend to activate more visual areas and they don't uh, predict uh, well-being. So it's not everything in the brain. So I'm gonna blow through my discussion. Um, I knew I would run out of time, so I just wrote it down. Uh, so basically, I think these results suggest that brain, our brains use multiple contextual cues during emotional language processing, where more, more cues equal less reliance on social processing related regions. Swear words uh, are more social contextually reliant words and load more on networks more associated with social and attentional related processing. The amygdala is only engaged uh, in some emotional and linguistic context and downregulated in others. Uh, and brain regions generally associated with language and those specifically associated with mental health uh, or uh, related language categories predict individual differences in well-being. So I think these results generally support a more constructivist model of the neurobiology of both language and emotions and their interrelationship, like the theory I sort of set out for you at the beginning. So, thank you. You'll have the questions um, later on. So when you are submitting your uh, questions in, the, in our audience response system, if you can save who the question is for, that's very, very useful. We are getting dozens of questions now. Uh, 